Again, Jerry and I are both from uh, the Friends of Point at Game Farm, which is located just a little bit north of uh, Madison. I'll give you a brief uh, bio of myself. My name is Paul Mayer, uh, nickname is Jumper. I used to have a four-wheel drive truck in many ways that had that name on it, because long story. Um, I'm 59 years old. I'm married to my first wife, Ann, for 30 years. I have two children, Travis and Haley. Travis is 28, and my daughter, Haley, is 27. Um, she's married, and uh, I have a three-year-old Labrador Retriever I did not bring because we brought Jerry's dog, and my na dog's name is Amos Moses. Um, he's quite a comical fellow, too, so he's my companion hunting partner. I live in Reeseville, Wisconsin, which again is about 38 miles north of Madison, um, close to Beaver Dam, if you know where that area is at. I'm um, like 10 miles south of Beaver Dam. Uh, again, I was a charter member of the Friends of Point of Game Farm. We'll get more into that. Um, <clears throat> I'm the owner of Precision Stripping and Tires, which I do plastic media, sandblasting, and tractor truck car tires and fabrication, auto restoration, things like that. Been doing that for 26 years. Before that, I worked uh, for Royal White Spices and Pro Smoker and Roaster, which is out of Iron Ridge, Wisconsin. And there I sold and manufactured smoke houses for industrial and commercial, along with uh, residential smoking of meats and producing meat products like that, your Venice and all that, and I traveled all over the United States doing that. It was a lot of fun, got to know a lot of people, traveled all over, around here, everywhere, but unfortunately I was never home. Uh, so, hence I started my other business. Uh, I'm a certified hunter safety instructor for over 35 years and uh, taught 4,350 students plus now. I am a certified NRA range safety officer and a chief RSO officer. Um, I went through the NRA's range development operations uh, in 2004, which is for ranges and developing them how to set them up and make them safe. A uh, big part of my <clears throat> life is I like to shoot firearms and the shooting sports and also hunting. Hunting is one of my passions. Um, I started the Friends of uh, NRA in Dodge County in 2004, which I'm the chairman of that. And that's going on 17 years and we do fundraising for like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, any shooting sports, classic shooting, things like that. So if you get high school trap teams, chances are we've funded some money for those. Uh, they also helped us with our Friends of Point of Game Farm, getting us a trailer, a lot of firearms so that when we do our learn to hunt programs for kids, which we do with Friends of Point of Game Farm, uh, we have firearms for the students to use. Uh, my hobbies again are hunting, and I love pheasant hunting and bear hunting. Uh, those are my two major ones, shooting all types of firearms, and then again cooking, smoking, curing meats of all kinds. Uh, I <coughs> like to just thank you all again once for all for coming here. Jerry, I'll turn it over to you shortly to okay. talk about yourself, and then we'll get on to uh, the Friends of Planet Game Farm, the history, and pheasants. All right, well, I'm 70 years old. I've been retired for five years, and uh, <clears throat> I'm not doing exactly what I did when I worked, for the simple reason that uh, when I worked, I worked pretty hard, but when I retired, I wanted to do things for me instead of for someone else. So, um, <clears throat> I'm divorced back in 70s and 80s. I was married for nine years and it gives me two daughters and them two daughters gave me five granddaughters. So I have no sons to give my toys to. But we'll figure that out as it comes. Um, I, I come to Friends of Point at Game Farm as a dog person. Uh, I grew up with dogs, had dogs all my life. and. Uh, one of my jobs was I was a installer for a retail store company and uh, went around the country catching a uh, semi-tractor with 40,000 pounds of particle board and in three and a half days it was a turnkey operation. Set the store up with the shelving, the checkouts, all the right down to the toilet paper in the bathroom and then turned the key over to the manager and I came home. So I did a lot of net. I wasn't home a lot either. So one of the reasons why I got divorced, but uh, 
Uh, no regrets. Uh, my daughters are very local, and, and I babysit once one day a week yet, and uh, my personal life is uh, very stable. Um, like I said, I've come to uh, Friends of Point Game Farm as a dog person. My first experience with the Friends of Point Net Game Farm, I was a dog handler for a Learn to Hunt program. Didn't know anything about Learn to Hunt. I really didn't care. I was thinking more of myself and my dog to give me another opportunity to get my dog out on birds, um, shoot and retrieve, and uh, I really enjoyed that. I trained for that for every dog I've ever had, so um, it, it was a natural fit. The person that invited me to the Learn to Hunt was a person by the name of Vic Connors. Vic Connors and I knew one another from previous experiences because I judged field, field trial dogs for 14 years. And Vic was also a field trial judge. And uh, that, uh, I spent many hours together looking at dogs, talking about dogs, you know, just, just enjoying our lives. Uh, unfortunately, Vic passed away from a heart attack the Monday from the weekend we were down in Iowa judging dogs and it was a huge shock to me. And at that time I figured, you know what, I feel like I felt obligated to step up to the Friends of Point at Game Farm and become more involved than just a dog handler or a mentor for uh, a novice hunter. So um, that's how I came along. I've, I've trained dogs for people. I've uh, tested dogs both in the German system and also the North American versatile hunting dog system. Uh, dogs have been a real major part of my life and uh, this is a prime example of a great hunting dog. I, um, a lot of people say I've got the best of both worlds. I've got a dog that behaves, um, is, is everything I want in the field, does all kinds of retrieves for ducks, uh, blood tracks, deer, pheasants of course is, is we get a lot of pheasants in the year because I do a lot of learn to hunt programs. So um, I'm the coordinator for the Friends of Point Ant Game Farm for the Learn to Hunt. All participants come through me. I uh, take their information, I get them signed up uh, through the NRA grants and stuff. We, uh, you don't need any of the equipment. If you have a desire to learn how to hunt pheasant, and I don't care, you can be 10 years old or you can be 65 years old. We'll bring you into the field, we'll show you exactly what all that's about. But again, I wanted to emphasize that I came to this because of the dogs. Um, I also knew uh, Vic Connors was one of the originators of the Friends of Point Eight Game Farm. The other individual was a band by the name of Bob Knack. Bob Knack and Vic <coughs> Connors sat down back in 2010, 2010 and formed Friends of Point Eight Game Farm and the Learn to Hunt program. Vic was interested in Learn to Hunt. Um, Bob Knack was the director of the game farm at that particular time for the DNR. So um, the reason I knew Bob Knack before I knew him as the director of the game farm, I helped train two dogs of his. So we had a personal relationship before I ever knew he was involved in the learn to hunt or the game farm. So uh, I, I've done a lot of things. I'm just kind of looking through my notes here. Um, get to know who I am. Uh, I have, uh, Friends of Point Game Farm certainly is a major part of my life and hours that I put in. I've also trained two dogs for Custom Canine Service Dog Academy out of Madison. Uh, my first dog was a yellow lab and he went to an autistic 14 year old boy in Illinois. And uh, the last dog which I lost this summer in June went to a 34-year-old post-traumatic stress serviceman that was playing in the sand overseas and then also had diabetes. So I trained that dog to be a diabetic alert dog as well. So like I said, dog, uh, <coughs> kind of where I'm going. Um, uh, again, retrieves ducks off the pond, uh, blind retrieve, uh, even if you shot the dog or you shot the duck and you came to me to, geez, you think your dog can retrieve my duck that's out in the pond somewhere. I said, sure, let's do that. And I can mark her, send her, and uh, everything comes back. 
she comes forward and presents game. Uh, uh, like I said, I got the best of both worlds there. But uh, the, the friends of Point at Game Farm, um, as I said, takes up a lot of my time. We uh, sex chicks in the spring. Of course, you never get all roosters out of a nest, and you don't get all hens out of a nest, so they, uh, they need to be identified. We do have some film on how to do that. Uh, at, at five and six weeks of age, they come out of the brood house, and we transfer them to the flight pens. We're raising over 78,000 birds this year on the farm. Uh, we have 91 pieces of property that we release birds on. At Kickapoo Valley here is one of the places that we release them birds. So um, it's, it's just a lot of fun for me being retired. Uh, they, give me, they give me a list of dates they need me, which uh, normally is uh, 2,200 to 3,200 birds they're pulling in a day to load on the trucks, and they need all the help they can get. Go ahead, please. So, <coughs> you know, um, how many birds you're going to release per area? What's your criteria for that? Actually, them figures come between the DNR, the amount of land, uh, a, a huntable land. You know, I mean, if uh, if you have a big lake somewhere, they're not going to consider them acreage as uh, pheasant territory. But it, it, that's, I have nothing to do with that, but that's how they form, how many birds come, you know, um, to the, a particular area to hunt. Yeah, they work very close with the biologists in, in the areas throughout the state. They got certain biologists for all the areas. And then they know their acreage and, and they got a formula of how many birds, you know, for the areas that they can put into their, and that's how they work that out. And then my other question I had too was, um, and I could be jumping the gun here, no pun intended. That's okay. No, that's fine. Question? No. <coughs> we'll, we'll do some redundant stuff. That's fine, because that's good. Um, what percentage of your released birds survive the first winter? Probably less than 5%. Yeah. Okay. Less than, uh, in fact, I would even say maybe 3 Yeah, I was going to say 2 to 3, uh, yeah. That's unfortunate. Um, uh, Paul and I talk about this a lot. We would like to see more areas in our state to try to get the wild pheasant back um, for many reasons. The first, the first is that's the way it was when I was a kid. I didn't need a dog to hunt pheasant, I just need to walk a fence line. But uh, the farming practices, the agriculture practices, um, Lots of Paul, Paul said, like Paul said, that we're not raising a lot of wheat or barley anymore in this state. Right. Everything's gone to beans and corn. Well, that don't help these young birds at all. And then when you roll it over and you make nothing but dirt for the winter, that leaves nothing for them to survive on. And so between, between sustainable habitat and predation, I imagine predation is pretty heavy. Predation, uh, yeah, pulls in a big part. Unfortunately, the, the birds that we're raising on the farm aren't wild birds. You know, they certainly they certainly act wild to us because they don't they are mm -hmm. they don't want to do anything with humans or dogs. So they're going to try to fly away from you, but the problem is that, that we have hawks and owls and stuff that are not controlled, and uh, eagles. <laughs> yep. There's, I mean, it's more the raptor and the things that take our birds than it is the coyote or the fox. You know, um, the young birds in the wild, if they're nesting, uh, they have like five weeks to be able to fly. You know, once once they can take to the wing. Their chances of survival in the wild are a lot better. Um, snakes take the eggs, raccoons, skunks, possums. I mean, you name it. it yeah. It's amazing. <coughs> the only other thing about that is that I have a pheasant, which we have a display here. Um, she will have three nests a year. If she loses a nest, she will re nest mm -hmm. up to three times. So the roosters are really looking for girlfriends all the time. And that's that's what this bird here is. But uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we've lost a lot of agriculture and habitat to sustain that wild bird. But uh, like like Paul and I talk all the time, we'd like to see more studies done that we could bring some of them wild birds back. You know. And there are some other programs that we'll get into later on about what we can do to you know the birds that are being hatched, like the hens, that 
we can maybe get into a Dale Chick program where other groups can work, and we'll get into that a little later. In the spring, if you see, <coughs> if you see a bird alongside the road picking up grit and things like that, a pheasant, that's like seeing a big buck, you know. And you see a big, big buck once, once in every five, six years. Um, that's the way we look at our rooster pheasants that have survived the winter. Right. Mm -hmm. That don't mean they're going to survive the fall, but. Uh, I guess I'm going to turn it back over to you. Why don't you talk a little bit about job, what type of dog she is, and uh, you didn't cover what, what type of dog do your dog oh, get? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Java is my partner. She's uh, five years old. I've had one litter. She's a German bloodline dog. Uh, her official title is a Deutsch Drothar. Deutsch Drothar, Drothar in German means wire hair. So she's like the German wire hair pointer, but in the German bloodline side. Um, I've had her since a pup. I bought her at eight weeks old, and uh, she's been a partner ever since. I've taken her through NAVDA. She's a utility one dog in the NAVDA organization, and she's also passed her German <coughs> testing. That's why I can breed her in the German testing. So, go ahead. Our draw hairs, um, pointers. The draw hair is a versatile hunting dog. They point in the field, okay. very strong pointers, retrieve everything. Um, I always said if you can hear it, smell it, or see it, it's going to be yours because these dogs don't give up. A lot of times I have to call her off, which is a, a lot of times that you don't want to listen to me. She is extremely a hunting dog. But, and what uh, are the setters and clumber spaniels? Spaniels, they're versatile dogs. You know, the German short hair. That's a versatile dog. The Weimaraner, that's a versatile dog. The Visala, that's a versatile dog. So in the NAFTA system, they test versatile dogs. So when I was a 14, I, I judged for 14 years, but when I was a judge, I would see a lot of versatile dogs. Never did see a lab, though. That's because I didn't have mine there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you then. <laughs> I see some yeah. But, uh, and, and, and they are work. I'm not saying she's not work, but she's also very, very satisfying for me to have around. So, any other questions? I appreciate your, your enthusiasm. Oh, I'm crazy about pheasant honey. No, what? <laughs> Great. So are, so are. <coughs> and I'm crazy about dogs, so. I'm probably your best friend here. Oh. <laughs> You're her best friend. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'll okay. Check All right. You later. Okay, we're going to talk uh, a little about the, about the Ringnick pheasant, uh, the Wisconsin State Game Farm, the hatchery, the Friends of Point Game Farm, and how important hunting is, uh, the hunting heritage of Wisconsin is. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a little. Part of my throat here. Um, hunting is part of Wisconsin culture. 895,000 people hunt in Wisconsin each year. Uh, $12 million being spent in Wisconsin. In 2018, Wisconsin sold 31,326 individual pheasant stamps and 1,039 conservation patriot license with those pheasant stamp approvals for a total of 32,365 pheasant stamps. Pheasant hunting in Wisconsin averages approximately $500,000 per year. Uh, it's important to note that that amount approximate and can vary a little bit year to year depending on the seasons and things like that. But just to give you some idea of the dollars that, you know, just pheasant hunting, but hunting alone brings into Wisconsin. Uh, in Wisconsin also, uh, hunting supports the economy very well. It supports over 34,000 jobs in Wisconsin. The average hunter spends on the average over $2,800 per year. Uh, the bottom line, it's a ripple effect for Wisconsin that totals over $4 billion that comes into our state from just hunting. So <clears throat> part of that being with the pheasants, deer hunting, everything, but the pheasant hunting is important too. Um, and uh, at this point, I'll let Jerry talk to you about the pheasants. And he's gonna explain a little bit about the pheasant. Pheasants are found all over the world. Um, uh, they're not all the ringneck pheasant, and of course it's easy to see why we call it the ringneck pheasant. It has that white ring around the neck, so it gets it gets labeled ringneck pheasant. Um, the males are always colorful, regardless of what um, subspecies you have, but the hens are always drab. And that's basically for camouflage reasons and the, uh, the rays of the 
the little chicks are also very drab in color. You get that one. Um, habitat, uh, mixed farmlands, native grasses, along with marsh, uh, brush and woodlands. You can just about find them anywhere, but they do prefer the, the prairie grasses, um, especially through the summer and stuff. That's where they find their grasshoppers, the crickets, the mosquitoes, um, the, the wild grains that, that grow up, uh, things of that nature. So they, they really are adapted, but they do like to be in marshy areas as well for water and things of that nature. Um, they eat a variety of stuff. I mean, um, the ones on the farm, once they get mature, the roosters are pretty much primarily corn. We grow corn right inside the flight pens. And uh, as they mature and we hold them to be released out, we'll go in and knock the corn down and make sure that they can uh, pick the corn off the top, basically. Um, but they do, they eat ants, they eat bugs, caterpillars, grasshoppers, lizards. Uh, it's, it's amazing to catch the birds up on the farm because anytime there's a defect in one bird, all the other birds will start picking on that bird until it dies, and then after it dies, they pick at the meat and stuff until the point is just a scout and if it's left in there long enough. Now, I want to say that the employees of the game farm, they walk, what they call, we walk the pens for death. Now what that means is they, they basically walk inside the pens and try to find all the dead animals because there is a certain amount of predation that goes on at the farm through the years as you raise these. And it, and it starts at a day old and it goes right through until we catch them and, and bring them out to release on 91 pieces of property. Um, uh, they're a fairly large bird, three and a half, four pounds. Uh, some of the birds this year I think are probably four and a half. We've got some really nice birds this year that we're sending out to be hunted. Uh, basically they probably got two pounds of fat on them. <laughs> but they, and very good eating, so um, I do enjoy them. Uh, let's see, uh, if, if you've ever been around a pheasant, they are very noisy birds. The, the males, the males cackle, um, uh, show their dominance, they fight. Uh, if you look, this is not a very good example of their spur, but they have spurs on the back of their legs. They, they fight like a, like a rooster chicken. You know, they jump in the air and the spur spurs one another. I gotta do a little, that's not right. Right here. Okay. Um, uh, and, and again, they, they are very territorial. Uh, even inside the pens, when we herd them around to get them into a catch box, what they'll do is there'll be a, a certain group of, of pheasants that like this corner of the pen. So as a group, we try to herd them around. The ones that want to go back to that corner, that's their spot. They want to go back to what they call home inside the pen. So they're very territorial that way. Uh, they fly, <coughs> but I think they prefer to run before they want to fly. Uh, another good reason to have a good dog is because if a dog's on their track, on their trail, and the bird knows it, they don't want to get up and fly. They'd much rather run, but a dog will hold them in spots. So uh, another reason why I like a good hunting dog. But uh, they do run more than they fly. If you find one in the field, you'll probably fly, fly maybe 150 yards, drop back in somewhere, and then they're going to go 500 yards from the spot they drop in. They don't just sit there. Um, amazing bird. So, uh, see what we got here. Uh, the hen nest. Um, they're on. They're on the ground. They like to nest in grassy areas. They'll, they'll even pull grass and, and just like kind of a robin, always have a soft bed for the eggs. They'll lay themselves eight to 16 <coughs> eggs. Normally it's about 10 to 12 on the farm that, that come from an individual hen. And uh, the incubating period is 22 to 27 days. Now, when I go and I sex the chicks from the farm, 
which means we, we sort the hens and the roosters, which are, are notable because the hens, the hens and the rooster eye is different. If you notice the, the crest and the comb on the rooster, that's apparent even in the young. Doesn't look like that, but you can see a difference between the hens and the roosters, and that's how we uh, sex them. And of course, the roosters, most of them stay on the farm, and we have what they call a day-old chick program. Uh, a lot of individual uh, hunt clubs or, or uh, dog scouts, dog training clubs. You know, <coughs> we will sell day-old chicks to them off the farm, so that we don't have to destroy all the hens. They will, they pretty much get the hens to raise dog trainers, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. So. Uh, there is a purpose for the hens as well. Plus, we uh, we keep about 1,500 to 1,800 roosters uh, for stocking for next year. Every bird is vaccinated, and we keep about 4,000 hens. And half of them hens are raised inside, so if we get a bad winter and we lose some outside birds, we still have birds to lay eggs that we can uh, raise for the next year's stock. Most of the birds that you shoot are one year old. They were raised in the spring, and they look like that in the fall. So, um, life expectancy, a wild pheasant, if we get two years out of a wild pheasant, he's been really lucky. If it's in captivity, they'll go as much as even 13 and 14 years. So, I mean, there is, if, if, if they're smart, and they're out there, hopefully they survive. They certainly will live a long time. They, not like a rabbit, where I think you only get about two and a half years out of a live rabbit. So, uh, in captivity, I got to know here. There's the oldest one that we know of is uh, 23 years old. So they do. A bird lives a long time. I mean, if you get a parakeet or whatever, it might outlive you. So, uh, have any questions on the bird itself? Go ahead. The bird. Well, I, um, we have a. CRP land, is that beneficial? That's good, that's good area for them too, that's good habitat, yeah. Yeah, <coughs> yeah, yeah. And, and food plots with small yeah. grains, yeah. Well, sunflower seeds, that kind of thing. I mean, they you eat know. the leaves, they eat the grasses, but it also holds other, you know, uh, grasshoppers, insects, things like that for them to get their nutrients, whatever they need, you know. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's good area. And the bigger the fields like that, the better it is. We get heavy snow and it covers and packs it all down. The smaller fields where like say you get out west for the say like South Dakota you got huge fields like that they get the snow like that but it kind of just gets the edges around the edges but the whole center's got high standing grass yet for cover so the predators the hawks the owls can't get them they got places to go so it provides great cover for them too as far as the habitat to survive in. I, I'd like to be able to tell you that, that if you've got an acre and a half you can raise a pheasant but it's not that easy. Uh, you can have pristine ability to uh, give that pheasant everything it possibly needs and there'll be something in its environment that just doesn't want to make it stay there. You know, they're a very independent bird. Um, uh, I, I, I know for a fact that uh, five acres is plenty for a couple birds to survive if they <coughs> stay there. But, but again, uh, there's no guarantees of that. So, go ahead. How many roost at night? <coughs> I'm sorry? Where do they roost at night? Yeah, they roost in trees. They, uh, they're not like a turkey, though. I mean, a turkey will fly up you yeah. know, 20, 30 feet off the ground. If, if, a, if, if you find a pheasant roosting outside of the grass, because a lot of times they'll stay on the ground and they, they just cover you in on grass, yeah. but uh, maybe two or three feet, some of them. Yeah tree that it fell over or something yeah they won't get very high much like the light maybe about about that height or what that mercy light is i've seen them roosting trees that high not normally highly higher than that they mostly stay close to the ground yeah i think some of that is because of the coloration birds see color and so do the predators so if you see a real nice shiny good looking rooster there might be a red tailed hawk looking at him too yeah know? or a ho owl or yeah, yeah. Owl. And the hens are mostly staying on the ground because they get the nest they got to take care of. So, but the roosters will, or the cocks, or whatever you know, they will sometimes fly up and roost in trees or bushes. A lot of times, plum thickets, things like that, they'll go into. Those are great for them. Great cover. Did that answer your question? <coughs> yeah. 
Um, the turkeys, we have so many turkeys around. Have they influenced the population of the pheasants? Uh, I think the pheasants were gone before the turkeys came. I can remember hunting in the state um, 30 years old and never having a turkey. What, what the DNR did in Wisconsin is they traded our rough grouse for Missouri's turkeys, okay? And that's how it got started. There was only two or three areas and, and they just, the turkeys just took off. They're, they're everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and uh, they're almost a nuisance now as yeah. far as my, my personal. Yeah, I, I'm sure they, you know, they, the competitiveness or a bigger bird, they're gonna take the food away from something smaller like that. Um, but like I said, they, they, they're hardy, they're everywhere. You know, they're, I hunt up in upper Minnesota, way up in, in Highway 2, and there's in the woods for bear hunting, and you see turkeys up in there. It's just amazing how, you know, in my lifetime, when I remember guys going down south turkey hunting, I never thought I'd hunt turkeys in Wisconsin either, and here they are flourishing like heck. When I grew up hunting pheasants, now you don't see any, and we'd like to get that back somehow, some way. Well, it's, uh, <coughs> and, uh, Paul and I talk an awful lot of wanting to establish a wild turkey flock somewhere. Um, Pheasant there are, flock. There are some areas in the state that are are hundreds of acres, you know, and it's closed except for like deer hunting and uh, um, perfect habitat. Perfect, perfect grassland. Uh, they call it the savannas, oak savannas. Uh, if you ever in the, in the forestry area, I don't know that much about that except for the fact that it's grassland. And if we put a few food plots out there, I would really like to see the DNR and a biologist try to establish the old pheasant. And the reason I like that is it, uh, the pheasant, especially the cock pheasant, has beautiful tail feathers. The older they get, the longer the feathers are. And some of the old birds that I've seen uh, from some of the pheasant hunters, the older established pheasant hunters, you can get into 28, 30 inch tail feather. Almost a yardstick. So, but it takes a mature bird to do that. Yeah, when I moved where I was, one guy shot one on our property, and I was in 70, 1977, it was 26 and a quarter inch. I mean, it was huge, you know. For Wisconsin, that's, that's pretty darn good, so. Any other questions that I might be able to answer about the birds? Uh, brief history on the ringneck pheasant. Again, the pheasant is not native to Wisconsin or the USA as far as, you know, they were from Asia, uh, brought in from China, and it was introduced to Waukesha, Wisconsin in 1800s by Gustav Paps from the Papsbury. Uh, he's the one who really brought them here, and then they took off in Waukesha County and flourished, and they took over into Jefferson County, and then from there it just started building, and then they were just about everywhere. Um, and then that population grew. But then about 1950, that population started declining. And a lot of it happened to do with urban, you know, sprawl, uh, change in farming, you know, pesticides, insecticides, things like that. All those things came into play. Loss of cropland, loss of habitat, um, highways going through things, you know, just all kinds of things added into declining problems of the loss of the pheasant. Um, again, you know, the cropping practice had changed today. It's just like Jerry said earlier, there's nothing left on the ground. You know, years ago, you used to mow hay, you had a sickle mower, you cut, you know, maybe eight, eight, ten inches high, you went over the top of the nest. Now you're right down on the ground, you're also getting when the leaves are just starting, where you used to wait till everything was full blossom in your alfalfa fields. Now they're coming and taking it more because you get more protein out of it that way. But they're right down on the ground, they're sucking everything right up and taking, I don't know, fawns, turkey, you, you, whatever's out there, they're, they're eating them through the machine, you know, so they're, they're really fighting a hard battle. Um, again, you know, the small, small grains, there's just not many small grains anymore in the state being farmed or anywhere as far as that goes, everything's soybeans and corn. <coughs> um, Couple that with high demand and access of hunting land. There isn't that much hunting land anymore, uh, which makes it more difficult for people to hunt. Um, so that's why it's important for like the state game farm and the stocking program, because we do have public grounds. Uh, and sometimes that won't sustain them for the whole year, but we can put the birds out there for the hunters to hunt. And, and some birds may get a foothold, you know, but at least we got something going where we can enjoy the still pheasant hunting that we used to kind of know and, and get some birds going. Um, so in order to stock those birds on the public lands and also on some private lands, those grounds, uh, they need to hatch them, they need to raise them, 
and then you got to release them. And it's kind of a jury's giving you a little input about of all the stuff that goes into them. We'll get into some old slides of the old game farm. Um, then we'll get into the today's uh, newer. It'll be just a little bit before we get that far. Um, <clears throat> and that's where the state game farm comes in. So dating back to 1928, uh, the Department of Conservation then began the stocking of pheasants in its inception and then the state experimental game and fur farm. And that was located over in Door County. Uh, and that process was to help bolster the already wild pheasant population because they seemed to start to decline a little bit. And they thought, well, if we can get some more birds out there, it'll help things take off. And it, it kind of did. Um, well, anyways, uh, in 1934, uh, the point at Game Farm is where everything's at now. There's all kinds of little game farms throughout the state, fur farms, uh, pheasant farms, you name it, they're raising deer, fox. And so a gentleman by the name of H.W. McKenzie in 1934, who was the Wisconsin Conservation Director from 1933 to 34, he took all those small little satellite places and said, we're gonna close them all up and we're gonna condense everything, we're gonna put it at Point At. And that's where the Point At game farm comes in. So they moved the whole facility to there, <coughs> excuse me, and the game farm served as a place for wildlife management, education, scientific management, demonstration areas, research and laboratory facilities, and a clearinghouse for confiscated live birds and animals. The goals of the state farm and the pheasant stocking program are to provide quality pheasant hunting opportunities on public and private lands and to promote the safe and ethical behavior in the field. Okay, now we get into the slides, okay? I don't know if you can read that or not. Uh, so that's part of the game farm. It's one of the buildings there. Intensive trapping, drought, fires, otherwise agricultural practices were depleted. Wisconsin's game supply. To counteract such destruction, it was necessary to restore natural food and cover, enforce uh, protective laws and livestock, or restock, excuse me. Uh, scientific feeding is an essential factor in successful animal breeding. The food for the animals is carefully selected and prepared. Blocks of ground horse meat and fish were kept refrigerated rooms at a temperature of four degrees below zero. They had some caves in there that are down underground where they would keep ice and keep uh, food for like, because they were raising, we'll get into a little more here, but they had mink, they had wolves, they had wolverines, fox, raccoons, everything in the same facility, deer. Okay, next slide, please. Um, okay, here they're making up their rations for some of the animals. They use cod liver oil, the bone meal, and some cereal and it shows them going into the old buildings and they've got the old meat grinders going and they make that emulsion up. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, next one please. Okay, there's another couple slides of them still processing the food, taking out the, some of the animals in the pens. Um, there they got the raccoon pens with the raccoons. And they studied them, you know, and sometimes they would make pets out of them, but they, it was a lot of research going on back then, you know. So again, it was laboratories, it was just learning a lot of different things um, and educating. Okay, the pens were cleaned each day and sanded regularly to prevent the soil from becoming contaminated. Uh, with raccoons, water is a very important uh, uh, element in their raccoons' existence. In their native state, these animals wash all their food before it's eaten. Uh, caretakers at the fern farm did train some of the raccoons to become playful pets and, and also intelligent ones. So you can see you know, they worked with them. Just some more pictures of the, you know, the pets hanging around them. Or Next one, please. <coughs> okay, here's some deer that they had on the farm. Um, by the way, there's still deer around there, but they're not in pounds. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they, they kind of studied everything, you know, and, and learned. And the biologists, it was a great place for, you know, for Wisconsin to really start learning about all different types of wildlife and their needs and wants and what they all needed. Uh, an efficient pathology section conducts research and investigates wildlife habitats to ensure the best for farming methods, diagnosis and treatment of disease animals, aid uh, game breeders throughout the state. So again, the research and development and scientific stuff. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the pathologist can, uh, conducts all of his disease control and feeding experiments with animals in this isolated section. 56% uh, of the United States supply of silver fox is produced in Wisconsin. Considerable experimentation is conducted with this species. <coughs> 
excuse me, periodically to fox at the farm or sprayed and given worm pills. I like say, no, I grew up in Cedarburg and I can remember seeing fox farms when I was a kid driving by. They weren't there anymore, but the pens were all up, just acres and acres and sometimes miles of pens. I'm trying to think where the other place was, uh, but um, Fromm was one of the big big ones um, from dog food now but they would uh, they would raise uh, a lot of mink and also a lot of uh, um, fox and then with that you know all the farmers would take their dead animals there and that's where they would get used for their food and that's what they use like think for the game farm too for them to, to feed anyhow moving on there's some wolverines and some fox there <coughs> There's another fox. The red fox is nucleus of the native fox family. Its uh, predatory harmfulness is balanced by its diet of rodents and woodchucks. They say they eat a lot of different things too. Next slide. Uh, the blue fox is native to Alaska and is difficult to raise in captivity. Its pelt also has a high market value. And just a little caption, can't take it on. Huh? Okay, there's some more. Uh, pine marten, okay, pine martens, America's sable, is a wilderness animal living in dense timber areas, uh, retreating before civilization. The marten is gradually becoming extinct, <coughs> so now they're protected, but um, you do see them now and then. But again, they had all kinds of animals at the, at the state farm. Pine martens feed uh, principally on mice and squirrels. Uh, the state hopes to replace them in the wildlife refugees where they will be protected. Okay, otters, they had otters there. Otters were playing, sliding down, they had areas for them. Uh, swift moving animals. Okay, the nutria. I don't know if there's any more nutria left in Wisconsin. I don't know, if there's a whole other thing about nutria. That's down south, but uh, they're like a big giant sized muskrat. Um, they were actually brought into this country by the little Tabasco company, McKinney. He's the one that brought them in, and they're really raising a lot of havoc down south, um, Louisiana, all that. But anyways, okay, next slide. How many acres is the farm? Nowadays, it's divided in half. Yeah, yeah what? The McKenzie Center, which is now run by the Parks Department in yeah. Wisconsin, and the other half is uh, the Pheasant Farm. Yeah, they split it up. Yeah, they split it up. That's a good question. Yeah, and I, and I don't know the total either. Well, I just can't imagine that they had this many, you know, studies I, I, going I on can in take one a, spot. I can take a stab at about 180, maybe 220. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking, I'm thinking closer to probably the two, two, above two to three. Okay. Um, but now with the road going through and they split it, so there's probably like 100 left on the, for the pheasant. Yeah, and on, on the <coughs> center, uh, that was taken over by the Parks Department, they had a nature walk there. They have bison there, they have the wolves there, and deer, uh, they have the small raccoons. Eagle, they got, so yeah. That. It's more for educational purposes and schools that come in. Um, we do have what they call the Midwest Outdoor Heritage Expo every year, and we bring young young pheasants in, and it's basically structured for 4th and 5th graders. And last year, I think we had 3,400, over 3,400 students come in. We bust them in from all over the state and they come in and they get off and there's everybody there, like Safari Club, uh, Pheasants Forever, us. Um, like I so said, we're there with the Pheasant Chicks. They get to look at them. Um, DU is there, all kinds of, and, and just all kinds of stuff for them to look at and learn. It's a great Department of Natural Resources is there. They got uh, fish things going on where the kids learn how to fish. They shoot bow and arrow, they shoot BB. It's, it's just a great, great facility. It's huge, Joe. It's a, it's a big facility. <coughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it was before it was split. Right, right. Okay, next one. Oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. We just got to get out of that one, and there's a PowerPoint one I'll get to in a little bit down on the bottom. The hatchery at the point of game farm had been housed in the barn that no longer could meet the poultry industry and the building standards for the pheasant disease risk biosecurity and energy efficiency and ADA compliance. <coughs> so that's where they got into 
we needed a new hatchery. Also, the 1950s era machines have become less reliable. Uh, they were breaking down parts and repair were getting very rare and very expensive. So the new facility was needed and to, to meet the demands and replace the outdated failing equipment. So in 2013, <coughs> excuse me, the State Billing Commission and Governor Scott Walker approved the design and construction of the new hatching facility, which is this facility here now that we're going to go into. Um, all right, so State Game Farm been raising ring of pheasants appointments since the 1930s. Uh, I'm trying to get an angle here today. State Game Farm raised 78,000. I think this year they're putting out close to 79,000. I think Kelly said the other night at our meeting. Who's uh, Kelly McGuire is the manager of the State Game Farm. Um, and it will release on the 91 public hunting grounds. Okay, next slide. Basically on that, that one there, that's the old facility, isn't it? Uh, I'm going to bust in here just a minute. Back up one, please. <laughs> they were sexing the chicks there. That's what I was going to get through. <clears throat> I'm crying. <Okay. laughs> there you go. Okay. okay. This, this was that's Jerry when he was young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. Oh, wow. The boxes down here are the sorted birds. You see the boxes here and also the different holes on the table. So as you sit there and you look, every, every bird has to be picked out of this box, looked at, and then this is an H, so the hens would go here, and the other would be R, so we put the roosters over there, that way we pull a box out, it's either a box of hens or it's a box of roosters. Now, I'm gonna tell you, to be honest here, maybe, maybe we make less than 5% mistakes. Every, I mean, when you look at some of the birds, some of them are very distinct. You can tell it's a rooster or a hen, and some of them are very questionable, and so you gotta get your best guess. That's why when we raise, here are some of the pens that the birds are raised in, when... Uh, <laughs> that's right, you can stay right there. That's, that's good, we're, we're yeah, good. No, I mean, I somebody, <laughs> no, somebody put you guys on a timer, and I... I okay. <laughs> so, and... and when we raise the roosters, we normally have about 3% hens in the rooster pen. And the reason that is is because someone made a mistake when we sorted the chicks out. And I would imagine all the hens that go to um, the day-old chick program, things like that, we probably make that same mistake with the roosters too. And of course they like that. So, uh, go ahead. That's okay. okay, no, that's fine. So they go out and in spring, um, you know, they, they do plant a cover crop in a lot of these flying pens. So then in spring they'll turn those over, but then they'll, lay, they, you know, they'll go out and pick the eggs up. Uh, they'll put them in a basket, um, and then they'll bring them in. Uh, so let's read through it. The winter cover crop is removed prior to egg laying season, March through June. This is done to encourage the hens to lay in the provided nesting boxes and not hide their eggs, because they do like to hide them. In addition to the nesting boxes, several shaded shelters are provided to give the birds a cool retreat when it starts getting hot. Those are the in indoor pens up there, and those are all sanctioned, and they can control the light and everything in there and the feeding, all automatic waters feeders. The indoor flock is housed in two environmentally controlled buildings. Each building contains five rooms, which the pheasants are separated into. The indoor flock will start laying eggs two weeks earlier than the outdoor flock. This is due to the controlled photo period length of daylight of the indoor room, so they can adjust that to make the birds think it's, you know, becoming spring sooner. Uh, to say, okay, eggs are collected twice from the indoor flock and three times daily from the outdoor flock. On the average, there are about 7,000 eggs that are collected per day. That's a lot of bending over and picking up eggs. We put a maximum of 150 eggs per basket. This reduces the risk of cracking eggs. Uh, new nesting material is added to the nest boxes daily. Gloves and boots are worn to disease, uh, to decrease the possible disease problems. Okay, here they're going, they come in uh, that door there, the eggs are collected, they're brought into the new hatchery, and this is a washer. It takes them through and it scrubs them and washes them, and when they come out, then they can check them for cracks and things like that. That's Kelly right there, she's the manager of the game farm. Hard working girl. Does a heck of a job. <coughs> That's Mark. He's, uh, he's basically the hatchery guy, and the guy before that collecting aid, his name is Patrick. He's a biologist on the farm. So, uh, I mean, they're very multi-talented individuals. Mark and, and, and all, uh, Kelly, everybody. When it comes to catching birds, nobody's sitting in their office. They're all out. Okay. 
The eggs are inspected for cracks and then sent to into a tray. Oh, back up one. That one have, that one shows a cracked egg. So you can see what a cracked egg looks like. We can get back to that one. There we go. Okay, it's got a hairline crack in it. So we'll try to find those and sort those out. So because they're just going to rot and create problems. Okay. <coughs> Uh, once trade they are put into the new incubators, the trays are marked with either a red tag or a blue tag with the date and the eggs were collected. Red is, is an indication of the indoor flock eggs and blue is the outside or outdoor flock. Okay, those are, those are the, that's, that's one incubator right there. Uh, pheasant eggs are incubated at 99% uh, or 99 degrees Fahrenheit with 51% humidity. The incubators will turn the eggs every two hours. In the wild, the hen turns the eggs throughout the day when they are nesting to prevent the chick from sticking to the inside the, the shell. Okay, April to July, after 24 days of incubation, the pheasant chicks are hatching. He's coming out. And they got a little tooth on the end of their beak so they can get themselves out. 15 minutes later, A little buzz, buzz, buzzer, it is. <laughs> uh, you can imagine that happens about 4,000 times within that 24 hour period. Yep. There you are. Okay. Uh, these little puff balls are all over. That <laughs> one needs to be picked up, looked at, and then sorted. So that's a fun part of it. Wait, yeah. at what age do you sex them? Okay. Here's here's how you day old. Yeah. From a hand. Okay. So you can see the to do look for the line of skin that is found above the eye. The line will develop into a waddle, which is that red like you see in the rooster. If they have a line, then they are a rooster. If there's no line, they are a hen. You can see the line on the rooster in the bottom, and there's no line on the hen on top. So that's what you gotta look for. You gotta and you're you're going through, so you gotta train your eyes and really look. And some are distinctive like that one. Some aren't aren't quite as distinctive. Yeah. Also on the chicks, <coughs> you see that little pointed beak on their on their beak, that little bump on their beak we go back i don't know if you can or not. that one's kind of got it on not quite as much though yeah the, the young one really had it yeah if it, it falls off within about two days can't go back <laughs> <laughs> you're lucky i'm not working it because we no uh one of the girls at the game yeah. farm made it yeah. somebody put you on a time frame <laughs> That's right. We'll just keep yeah. moving. So can you sort can you sort these telephones in? There's a rooster, the yep. one on the right's a hen. You can kind of see the difference. That's what we're looking for. And, and okay. So you got a line, no line. Yep. Okay. There we are. Okay. See the little knob on the end of the beak? Okay. That's, called, that's called the tooth. Right there. And that falls off in about two days after the so that's why you have to do them so quick. And that's how they break out of the egg. It's always easier to break out of the egg from <coughs> the inside than it is to break the egg from the outside. So, and, and as they roll around yeah. in the egg, they There you go. So now you know the rooster and the hen. So now you guys don't come down and sex, come sex down chicks. <laughs> <laughs> yep, okay. Once the chicks are sorted, they are counted and transported to the brooder buildings. Pans of feed are placed next to the silo feeders. This is to help the chicks find the feed. Gravity fed wa red water bells are placed low to the ground for the chicks to reach. And you got air tubes and heat and everything that's all controlled. Game farm staff carefully place the chicks in the starter room. Believe it or not, there's about 6,000 chicks in here. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. Another interesting point is in the brood houses when they're this young, it's always dark and you don't talk because the minute you say something, the little chicks want to talk to you like you're their mother. Yep. So uh, when, when we go into the brood houses and we make sure the feed is working and the water is working on it, we, we take flashlights and we don't say anything because they'll just walk through after three weeks, the pheasant chicks have grown so much they are moved to a larger room called the grow-out room. 
Okay, June and August. At six weeks old, they are transferred from the grow out room to their outdoor flight pens. Each flight pen holds 750 birds. And you can see the corn and stuff coming up and that'll grow and then they'll pick and they'll eat on the leaves and they'll find, you know, other sources of food other than what's in the feeders. You know, and they'll scratch and get grit and all that stuff too. One other side note, <coughs> up in the corner, on the upper left corner head that net. That's how we catch the birds. We go into the pen, they come into a kick pen, we scoop up four or five in a net, and then we carry them outside the pen and put them in the boxes. And then okay, outdoor birds are fed with bulk feeders that hold a 750 pounds of feed, which typically lasts them about 10 days. Special diet, a starter, and then they go to a grower, a finisher, and then corn, and then there's a breeder one for when they're breeding. Okay, Birds are watered with barrels using gravity-fed system. What kind of corn do you get? Shell corn? Red shell corn. Yeah. And you're looking at a rooster at eight weeks old on the far left. Fifteen weeks old, you can start seeing the coloring. And then uh, full plumage at 18 weeks old. No, it won't take them long. They grow pretty fast. October, December, each weekday morning during pheasant season, the Game Farm crew and friends of the point of Game Farm members corral and catch the birds for shipping. Rain would be the only thing that would cancel stocking for the day. A catch pen is located at the end of a funnel. This is where the birds are caught using nets. Hockey helmets are a must to keep the catcher safe from the pheasant spurs and from the beating wings and legs. Right, Jerry? That's correct. Game farm staff line up to get a net of birds from the catch pens. Pheasants are counted as they are put into crates by hand. 20 pheasants will go into each crate, 10 per side, with a divider in the middle. Approximately 3,000 pheasants will be get shipped across Wisconsin and released on public hunting grounds each day during the pheasant season. And that's when they're in those crates if they're wet, that's where they get tied up. So that's why you want to keep them dry. Wildlife management staff pick up the birds and release them into the uh, public hunting grounds. Or in our case, volunteers. Yep. Yeah. And thank you, thank your volunteers. Uh, yeah, and there we are, uh, you know, with dogs retrieving, hunting, and learn to hunt programs. These are, yeah, there's kids that are, uh, we had to go through our learn to hunt programs where we mentor them one on one. You got a mentor, and then we got dog handlers, and we get the birds from the state game farm, we put them out. If you want to know anybody who wants to do a learn to hunt program or get involved with the Friends of Planet Game Farm, these are our website addresses. Check us out. Just some happy groups that went through. We've had them come through from like say 10 years old to 70 years old. So today the game farm provides over 75,000 adult pheasants. They're released on 92 public hunting grounds in 36 counties. The farm also has a DOC program, which is a deal chick program. Um, those chicks are purchased for 15 cents per bird. They are used for all kinds of reasons. Some for training hunting dogs with, others raise and consume them themselves, while others uh, release them into the wild. The DOC program is a great program for groups such as FFAs, Boy Scouts of America, Girl Scouts, or any other youth or conservation organization that wants to get into uh, raising and releasing and trying to help repopulate and get young people involved and give them something to do besides play with a computer or a Game Boy or something. Uh, Friends of Point at Game Farm, that's where we come in. This organization was a vision of the game farm manager then Bob Knack, as, as Jerry pointed out earlier, <coughs> it was Bob who wanted to form a like-minded group of individuals who were ethical hunters and had a deep passion and love for pheasant hunting, along with the use of well-trained dogs as a conservation tool, and who wanted to pass all those wonderful things on to future generations so they would be able to enjoy them. So back in 2010, Bob called a couple friends, started out with uh, uh, Mr. Vic Connors, and those two got together and they started calling friends and friends and I knew Bob and he called me and uh, we had another game warden at the time who was close. Uh, me and her worked really well all together. It was Heather Gottschalk at the time. We did a lot of learn to hunt programs at Turkey and Pheasant and through the hunter safety programs and, we, and then we got involved and started forming the Friends of Planet Game Farm. Um, so they sat down and formed this group and in 2011 we became a 51 c 3 nonprofit organization and dedicated to supporting the mission of the Wisconsin State Game Farm and natural resources and their mission. Okay, um, Vic was our president up until 2016 when he passed away unexpectedly. 
And that's when I was on the board and I stepped up and took the presidency and then Jerry came on board and stepped up and I said he was pretty much our, one of our founding fathers that really got things going. <coughs> um, our objectives for the Friends of Point and Game Farm, support hunting and outdoor skills programs, including mentored youth and first time hunter programs, support hunting opportunities on private and public lands through fundraising and development of public support for game bird stocking. We also support educational programs for conservation and stewardship of wildlife, including habitat management, safe and ethical hunting practices, firearm safety, and the use of well-trained hunting dogs in the preparation and consumption of wild game. The Friends of Point at Game Farm also helped lobby to get the new hatchery approved. The Friends of Point at Game Farm appreciates the efforts of the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources to produce the high quality game birds at a reasonable cost. So I got a couple questions to ask you before we do a question and answer back. And here's a couple questions I'm going to read out. Do you enjoy the outdoors? Do you want future generations to share the same enjoyment? Do you support pheasant stocking on public lands? Do you value well-trained hunting dogs? If you answered yes to any or all of those, I'd like to have you consider becoming a, one of us with the Friends of Planet Game Farm. Thank you, we really appreciate your time and I'll try to answer any other questions.